God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Nobody like you. We bless you. We worship and we honor you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pause in your presence again. As your people, we come before you. We need to hear from you. If we don't hear from you, what will we do? We await the word from you, Spirit of the living God. Fall afresh on us, your people. Speak again. Speak through your servant. Speak to your servants. Glorify yourself. Honor your name. Honor your word. Father, we ask, we ask this afternoon that you will not only challenge us, but let your word bring change. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I want to thank Sister Bertine and Brother Matthew for sharing with us, for reminding us, for challenging us. Because we're living in an age when people are trusting in a lot of other things. Trusting in a lot of other people. The unfortunate thing about it is that all the other, all the other gods are the works of men. He is the most high God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'd like to share with us today and for the next two weeks. There's a word that the Lord has placed on my heart and it will constitute the first series for this year. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Exodus. We want to read from the book of Exodus. And I'm going to read one verse. At this stage, but there are other verses that I'm going to be reading as we go along. But in Exodus chapter 4, verse 2, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2. And the Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And so the topic for this first series is, What is that in thine hand? Brothers and sisters, the Israelites were in Egypt for 400 years. They were being oppressed. Of course, you remember how they got there? Joseph was sold into Egypt as a slave initially. He went there. God blessed him. He rose to prominence. He rose in the ranks of leadership. And then his father and his remaining family members joined him later on in Egypt. Because there was famine in their land. And over time, God blessed them. The Bible tells us that there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. Remember that God gave Joseph a dream. Gave the Pharaoh a dream. Yes. 
of the seven hairs eating up the other, or the seven cows eating up the other one, yeah, the meager ones eating up the other ones, and, and they never understood it, and Joseph interpreted the dream. Seven years of plenty coming, yes? Seven years of famine coming. Mighty God. He was promoted to be the man who would organize the country, yes? To reap the harvest and to... To, to, to store up the, the harvest and to navigate them through the time of famine. Of course, God blessed Joseph and blessed the crops and, and they, 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 they navigated through that difficult time. Over time, God's people, the Israelites, began to multiply greatly and the Egyptians became fearful that they were so great they began to reason to themselves that well if war breaks out they may join the enemy and defeat us so we are going to have to do something about it and they came up with a plan to oppress them to enslave them They were enslaved for 400 years. And in the midst of their slavery, they began to cry out to God for help. Brothers and sisters, people are enslaved today. There are people who are enslaved in sin. People are enslaved psychologically, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. They, 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 they are enslaved in our families. They are enslaved in our communities. They are enslaved at work. They are enslaved all around. As the Israelites cried out to God for deliverance, God heard them. God heard them. And he identified one man. Mighty God. God is still searching for a man. God is still searching for an individual. He identified one man. Moses in the Median desert. And invited him to lead his people out of Israel. I wish to propose to us today that out of Egypt. Yes. Thank you. I wish to propose to us today that God is still seeking for an individual who is available to bring deliverance to his people. I want us to examine the text. And there are three things that I want us to examine together from this text as we bring this message to relevance to our own lives today. I want you to imagine the people of Israel in slavery, under bondage, under oppression, and they are given work to do, and they are being flogged while they are doing it. Think of the young people who are probably, who, who are now enslaved, who are being trafficked, who are being held against their will, some of them young ladies were promised jobs in other countries and only now to become sex slaves. So many people are faced with all of these oppressive situations. How many people, sometimes it is not as bad as that. And sometimes people are working and working hard. And they're not being compensated fairly. Sometimes people are in their families and they're not being treated fairly. Sometimes it is in marriages and they're not being treated fairly. And so God, people are crying out. People are crying out. People are crying out. People are in all kinds of situations and are crying out. Crying out, God, help me. God, save me. God, deliver 
deliver me. Some of them don't even know our God, but they're crying out. And God, my brothers and sisters, in 2024, God is seeking for a man. God is seeking for a woman. God is seeking for an individual who he will be able to use to make a difference. I have news for you. Because God is seeking you. Mighty God. Can he find you? Are you available? But let's delve into the word. Because when I look at the text. There are some things the Holy Spirit said to me. First of all let's talk about an encounter with God. An encounter with God. Because in in these days, a lot of people are just going through the motions. A lot of people are just existing. The difficulties around. The deluge is around. The enslavement is around. And it doesn't bother us. It don't mean nothing to us. It's just another person. It's just another situation. So Moses, Moses, you'll remember, that as the Egyptians tried to minimize the expansion of the Israelite race as they oppressed them and depressed them and suppressed them. Pharaoh came up with an ingenious plan that the midwives, whenever a son is born, yeah, they should get rid of the son, kill the son. Moses' mother, who feared God, when her son was born, hid him. And Pharaoh's daughter found him. And God, in his wisdom, allowed Moses' mother to be his nurse. You can't get better than that. Moses was reared by Pharaoh's daughter. In the very palace. You think God is it? The same man. Who orchestrated the plan. To destroy all the males. He's now protecting Moses. Moses living in his house. He's protecting Moses. With all the military might of Egypt. The same man. Lord Jesus, somebody said the same man. Yeah. Lord Jesus, mighty God, when you, when, when, when you fear God, the Bible said when, when your ways please the Lord, if your enemies are made to be at peace with you, God will protect you in the midst of your enemies. The same man who gave the decree to kill him is now protecting him. Moses, so Moses grew up in Pharaoh's palace, yes? He learned the art, the language, educated, best educa education. But I want you to note something quickly, that his mother was his nurse. Before he went to be with Pharaoh's daughter, his mother would have kept him and nurtured him breastfed him and taught him the ways of God before she released him to Pharaoh's daughter. So in his spirit, in his soul, in his heart, he's walking around with the word of God. He knows he's not an Egyptian. He looks like one, but he's not one. He talks like one, but he's not one. In his heart, he knows. And the Bible says, when he came of age, mighty God. Mm. Can I say to parents today, teach your children the word. Tell them about God. Let them fear the living God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Teach them the word. Let them know the word. The Bible says train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Teach them the word. God, by his spirit, will store them. 
what is happening in this nation is that the children are not being taught the word. They are not growing up with the fear of God. And so we see the results of that. But, 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 but what he did was that as he walked one day, he saw, he, he saw an Egyptian, yes, mistreating one of the Israelites. And he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. The next day he saw two, two Israelites, you know, quarreling. And he came to say, no man, peace man. No, don't bother with that. And one of them said, eh? You won't kill me like you killed the Egyptian. <laughs> Word went to Pharaoh and he had to run. Moses had to run for his life. I, I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, sometimes God, God will allow, will allow. I want you to hear me now. Because one of the things that God created us with is will. When God made man in his image and, af and after his likeness, he gave man intellect, he gave man emotion, he gave man will, and he gave man moral capacity. Will. God works with us. God talks to us, but each of us has a will. And God is not coming to kick us down and kick down the doors and all of that sort of thing. We have a will. And we, we have to exercise our will. We have to make choices. And we must make the right choices. Because choices come with consequences. And in 2024, you must make right choices in 2024. Let's not go, let, let's not make the same mistakes that we made in 2023. No, we have to make the right choices. But, here is the man. He runs to media. And Jethro, his father-in-law, is taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. This is a man schooled in the best university in Egypt. Finest lifestyle ever. And he had to leave all of that. He's now in the desert taking care of sheep. Sheep is the animal that, well, apart from them giving the most trouble, the shepherds were referred to as the lowest class of employees. Th this kind of profession was, was frowned upon. That's what he had to resort to. He's in the backside of the desert. I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. Verse 1 says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. I want to talk about an encounter with God. What is an encounter? Encounter, the word encounter means unexpectedly meet or be faced with. Unexpectedly, he met up with God. He had an encounter with God. Encounter with God, brothers and sisters, begins in a place of isolation. What does it mean to be isolated? To be isolated is to be far away from other places, buildings or people. It is to be in a remote place. I believe God in 2024 wants to meet some people who are in isolation. Jesus, help us here today, God. The place of isolation is a place with potential for intimacy with God. It is a place where you are alone with God. It is a time when you are alone with God. It is, it is where you are free from.
from the distractions of life and are open in mind, heart, soul, and spirit for God to manifest himself and speak. You and I need to get to that place of isolation. We have smartphones. And they are so smart that sometimes they call people we never intended to call. Very smart. Yes. And they keep us distracted. Yes. And, 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 and if you're not careful they occupy your time all day I want to say to you as I say to myself God has a special assignment for each of us but we are too busy with activities and cluttered with noises and voices so we can't hear him see him or perceive him all the enslavement by the enemy that is going on God wants to do something about it. But God has to work through people. God wants people to work through. God wants you. God wants me. But we are busy. But like Moses, God wants people who are in isolation. You and I have to unclutter our lives. And get to that place where we will spend time alone with God. You and I are going to have to push away. Push away from the dining table. Push away from the TV. Push away from the phone. Push away from these things. And say, God, I want to spend time with you. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says... And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold the bush burnt with fire and the bush was not consumed. Brothers and sisters verse 2 indicates that God has a desire to meet with us. But he will not do so until we become available. I want us to understand God don't have favorites. God is looking for available people. Mighty God. Mm. So, so the text tells us, and the angel of the Lord. You, 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 you know, the term the angel of the Lord refers to what we call a theophonic appearance of Jesus. A pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. Yes? Yes? And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And the bush burnt with fire and was not consumed. So think with me. The bush is on fire. But the bush is green and pretty same way. When you and I are available, God will get our attention. When you and I are available in heart and soul and body and mind and spirit, God will get our attention. He will take us from the familiar to the unfamiliar and the extraordinary. Make yourself available. Make yourself available. 2024 is a year for availability. Verses 3 and 4 says, And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. God captured his attention. When he moved toward God, God called to him. Mighty God. God did not call to him until he moved towards God. God wants to use you. God wants to use me. But nothing is going to happen until we drop that which is distracting us and move towards God. The people you and I see God using, they are not some special type of people. There are some people who are available to God. <laughs> Mm. Mm. 
Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So I want to call us to availability in 2024. I want to call you. It is not rocket science. It's not, it's an, it's not any special assignment. It is just somebody who is hungry for God. And who says, you know what? I'm not going to allow you to distract me. I'm not going to allow this to distract me. I want more of God in 2024. I want God to walk with me, to talk with me, to use me. God, I am available to you. I'm available, God. I'm available. When you move towards God, God will speak. Mm. God does not have favorites. He reveals himself to those who desire him. In James 4, verse 8, the Bible says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And then in verse 5, the text says, and he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Verse 5 reveals to us, brothers and sisters, that God, that coming to God must not be with familiarity. When you and I come to God, we're not coming to God as our friends and cumberlers. We're not coming to God like our brethren. We're not coming to God like we're going to our sister and our brother. We are coming to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You and I must remember that he's holy. He cannot sin and he cannot tolerate sin. Take off your shoes. Where you are standing is holy ground. I want you to recognize that this is holy ground. God is holy and there must always be a sense of awe and reverence in our heart and in our approach to God. You and I must never take God for granted. And so... Take off thy shoes. This suggests unworthiness, unholiness, and the need to recognize that man is not on the same level as God. Whenever you enter his presence, you should engage in a physical posture to remind your heart of the place of humility that you should observe. So when we come and we kneel, when we come and we bow, when we come we prostrate we are reminding ourselves of our own insufficiency we are reminding ourselves that the one to whom we come is above us is beyond us in verse 6 the text says moreover he said I am the God of thy father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. God introduces himself as the one who has met and dealt with some of the greatest forefathers who all worshipped him. Moses knew about Abraham. Moses knew about Isaac and Jacob. These were were fathers of the faith. The patriarchs of old. Moses revered them. But God made him understood clearly. That I am their God. You revere them. But they worshipped me. Mighty God. When Moses is made aware. Of who God is. The Bible says he hid his face from God. For he was afraid to look upon God. Have you and I gotten to that place of awe before God? Are we at that place of familiarity where it's just another, another day, another Sunday, another morning? Do we live with a sense of awe of God? Anywhere God's presence is manifested, people fear God. Anywhere people do as they like, sing as they like, come as they like, 
you know the presence of God is minimal in that place. You and I have to examine our hearts to see where we are. Because anywhere the presence of God is magnified, there is fear for God. And so Moses had an encounter. God wants you and I to have an encounter with him. But let us talk quickly about the engagement with God. Not only an encounter with God, but an engagement with God. In verse 7, the Bible says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. Verse 7, brothers and sisters, has several lessons. One, it suggests that God knows all about our struggles. You in your small corner, I in mine. You in your dark corner, and I in mine. God knows. God knows what is taking place in your family. God knows what is taking place at work. God knows what is taking place in your community. God knows. When people cry out to God, it does not escape him. The Lord says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt. And I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. Those who are oppressing them, I see what is happening. I hear their cry. God hears the cry of his people. God is hearing God is responding and intervening in our situation, even though it seems otherwise. So God is doing something about the cry of the people in Egypt. He's in Median, the Median desert, talking to Moses. And he's talking to Moses about these people who are in Egypt and their suffering. Sometimes God wake you up here in America or in Jamaica, wherever you are, and he's talking to you about somebody in England, somebody in Australia, somebody somewhere else. God wakes you up to pray. Somebody is in trouble, and God wakes you up. God stores your heart to respond to that situation. May God find you. May God find me. May we become available to God. The people of God in Egypt are crying out for deliverance. And God is, in, is engaging a man in Median Desert to make himself available to be used in their deliverance. Brothers and sisters, hear me today. One man in the hand of God can make a difference. Almost over a million Israelites are in Egypt. God wants to deliver them. And God sought for one man. God wants to make a difference in your place of work. God wants to make a difference in your family. And God is seeking for an individual. I think a lot of times a part of the problem is that God is seeking for an individual and we are hoping he'll find somebody else. One man in the hand of God can make a difference. But the question is, can God use you to make a difference in your family, in your workplace, in your church, in your school? Can God use you? God can only use you if you are available. Thank you, Jesus. God knows those who are available to be used by him because they are first available to him as they spend priority time with him. I want you to understand, it seems so mundane, it seems so simple, it seems so, so parochial that somebody who moves away from the hustle and bustle and unclutter their lives 
and go and spend time with God. That God would engage them. That God would first encounter them, then engage them. As God intervenes in the enslavement that is taking place now. I want you to hear me well. Because God wants to make a difference where you are. And God wants to use you. Thank you, Jesus. So I want you to look at it. Look at verse 8. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them out of, the, out of that land unto a good land. And a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites. And the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Verse 8 reveals to us that God engages in our situation by himself first. Look at the text. The text tells us that God predetermines what he will do. It is God who says, and I am come down. I hear their cry. I see their suffering, And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. He pre predetermines what he will do. Secondly, he, pre he predetermines where he will take you. Look at it. He says, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land. And a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. He thirdly, he predetermines who he will defeat to establish you. He's going to defeat the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. All of them are in the land. They are in the land before you. But God has predetermined that he is going to establish you. And he will get rid of those who are the enemies. Leave it to God. God has already decided what he's going to do. What God needs is somebody to be available. Don't look at the enemies. Don't look at the Jebusites and the Perisites. God says he will take care of them. Mighty God. Verse 9, now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Verse 9 informs us that what we are going through is not hidden from God. What your family going through, what you are going through, what your neighbors are going through, what is happening in our country, God sees, God sees. In verse 10, come now, therefore, <laughs> come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. When God encounters you, he engages you. Is it that you're hoping God would talk to somebody else? That the kind of work you're hoping God will and give somebody else? He says, come now, I will send you. God, God works in partnership with man to deliver men, to bless men, to teach men, to help men, to change men. God works in partnership. God wants to partner with you. To bring deliverance. The question is are you available? Are you available? I want. I want us to examine our hearts where we are. I want you to understand this morning. That the situations. That bring you distress. That bring you pain. That God sees. God sees those situations. Those people who complain to you. Those people who call you. On your phone and talk to you. About the oppression they are faced with. Those people you and I. Will hear the news about. 
those people who other people will tell us about. I want you to understand God knows what is happening in their situation. In your situation, in my situation, and God wants to do something about it. But God works in partnership with man. And this afternoon, I want you and I to realize that the person God is seeking to work with is you. God is seeking me. Are we available? Are we available? Are we available? I'm going to, I'm going to stop there. And I want for us to contemplate. I want for us to contemplate. This time of fasting and prayer is a time to push away. Push away from the table. Push away from the phone. Push away from the television. Push away from the distractions. So that we, we can become available to God. To hear God. God's desire to work in our families, in our communities, in our country, in our workplaces. God's desire to work has always been there. God is always seeing the oppression and the evil. God is always seeing those things. They're always before him. God is seeking for a man, for a woman, for an individual with whom he can partner to make a difference in those situations. I think a part of the problem is we are hoping God will find somebody from somewhere and send them to come and help. And God wants me to tell you that he's looking for you. He's looking for you. He's looking for you. Lord Jesus, God is looking for you. Can somebody say God is looking for me? Lord Jesus, I came to church and I hope somebody was hearing the message. But God is looking for me. 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 I am the man. I am the woman God is looking for. Push away from the table. Push away from the phone. Push away from the television. Push away from the distractions. And come and encounter God. So that God can engage you. Can engage you. 